everybody, welcome back to Final Resonance TV and episode number 31 of Musical Journeys. Today, my guest is Dr. Jenny Boyd, all the way from London, England. Uh, Jenny, she has an amazing life story. One I, I Some of you know, probably, if you know Jenny Boyd, you know her life story. But just to give you a little bit of background, how we're here today is 32 years ago or 31 years ago, she wrote a book called Musicians in Tune. It was the first book that I had ran across on kind of the psychology and creativity of musicians. Um, and she has another book coming out that's adding to that called Icons of the Icons of Rock in Their Own Words later this month. Um, but her story starts out when she's six, when she moves from East Africa to England. Her, her sister and her become models uh, in England. And her sister gets on the movie Hard Day's Night and meets George Harrison. They get married. Uh, and so, something by the Beatles was written about your sister, right? And then after that, she marries Eric Clapton. And then, again, two songs written about her, Layla and Wonderful Tonight. And then you have a song written about you by Donovan, Jennifer's Juniper. And you guys become like the first two 60s muses of rock and roll, which is crazy, right? 65, you were dating Mick, Mick Fleetwood. And Mick Fleetwood, you get, you get with Mick, Mick in the very beginning of Fleetwood Mac in the early days with Peter Green. Um, yeah, it was before Fleetwood Mac started. Rocking. It was uh, when when I, yeah, when I met Mick, he was um, I was still at school, mm -hmm. and I would come back in the afternoons into the little coffee shop where all my schoolmates, you know, we all congregated there, and it was the same place that Mick, who was in a band called the Shanes. Um, he would meet up with everybody, so the van, get into the van and go and do the, the gigs all around England. And um, and so gradually we met up. And um, years later, he told me that when he'd see me in the afternoon with all my school friends, he'd say to himself, that's the girl I'm going to marry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. <laughs> so he did. So he did marry you. And you had two daughters. Then he did. Yeah. So one of the probably most iconic things about your history is that you went to uh, India with the Beatles in 68 for the uh, study of the of meditation with the, the Maharishi, which we all know the photos. We've all seen the photos. And of course, you're in the photos with them over there. And you go through this period with them when you get to see all their creativity happening. And this sort of spurs your 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 mind, I guess, that you weren't were you not you, in your book. You say you weren't you didn't feel creative. Is it because of that mo those moments with all those creative people? No, I think it was way before that. Okay. You know, I'm one of six children, I was. And um, I think that uh, I always wrote. I loved to write. Even when I was really young, I'd write stories. And then I started writing poems. But I always felt that I wasn't very creative. But when I met up with Mick and then when they became Fleetwood Mac and I'd go to the studio and you know watch the songs take place Peter Green writing all these songs and I just um compared myself in some sort of way okay. to these amazing musicians because they were the ones that I knew and of course you know who is going to be as creative as them it's kind of quite rare right. but um I think I felt it was more of a sense of I didn't feel I didn't know what I had as a way of self-expression. Even though I was writing, I didn't think of that as something that was, you know, creative. Right. Well, because you're around super creative people. And I think it's I think it's interesting, yeah. you know, like when we watched this documentary, Get Back, that came out, as the mm -hmm. general public gets to see what you saw, more or less. Right? Yeah. Would that be yeah. Right? yeah. Right. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, because and to, um, you know, go on. To to watch them work, you know, in that situation was sort of like akin, I guess, to what you witnessed. Yeah, and it was so easy for them; it was no big deal. You know, we'd be sitting on the roof of our bungalow, and there'd be George and John and um, and Paul and Patty and I and Cynthia Lennon and. Um, Sometimes Jane Asher, Paul's girlfriend, and we would be doing stuff and um, sitting in the sun in the mornings and say, John would come up and just say, oh, you know, I really couldn't sleep last night. And then they'd start strumming away and start making that into a song. Or, you know, when they were 
doing Dear Prudence. Prudence was kind of, um, had sort of lost the plot, really. And so I went in with my flute that I'd got from San Francisco, and John came in with his guitar, just started singing Dear Prudence. But she was in this kind of another world, you know, she couldn't get out of this trance. And so it was just a matter of trying to get music or get some way of getting her out of the trance. So everything that they wrote while we were in India, in the ashram, was everything to do with what was going on in the surroundings. It wasn't like thinking of things from somewhere else, you know, Bungalow Bill, you know, or, or all those places. All those um, subjects were to do with what was going on in the ashram. That's amazing. That, that, that must mm. have been an incredible experience. And one of the things that I want to get into with the creativity and, and this particular time of meditation and all that is because the book kind of centers around a lot of this different meditation techniques. I, I really think they're sort of meditative techniques that musicians kind of come to somehow. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, you had this spiritual awakening that, that you talk about in your book. Well, well, I was in San Francisco for six months. I wanted to, it, it just so happened that I found myself in San Francisco because a friend of mine would just opened up a shop and uh, I was modeling at the time in England. And, uh, and she said, why don't you come over and help me with this shop? And we didn't know anything about flower power. This was 1967. Okay. And um, I thought, great, you know, I because I'd had what I called like a spiritual awakening, sort of like, well, what's life all about kind of thing. And I was 19. And um, so I went over there. And there was everybody saying, you know, express yourself and giving each other flowers and taking acid and, you know, just uh, it was all about creativity. And there were just paintings and drawings and everybody was doing stuff that was very creative. But I was looking for, um, you know, what was the meaning to life mm -hmm. very much. So when we went to India, I got what I wanted, but I, but through meditation rather than smoking pot or, or taking acid or everything. And so it was an incredible time. And it was watching people who were also just, you know, expressing themselves, like like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Now you talk about Ra uh, Ravi Shankar and how the the this is something that I always see with musicians is when you're in the creative act, you kind of do you, you kind of uh, you lose not consciousness, but you lose the mental process that you normally carry around in your head all the time. If you're in it, if you're really in it, you know. Yeah, and that's well, that's, we have a, yeah we have a lot of that in the book. You know, I asked all these um, originally when I wrote the book, the book that you've got it was seventy five musicians, and asked them all all questions about their creativity. And one of the questions that I ask is, you know, have they ever had what was at that time called a peak experience? It was um, philosopher uh, psychologist Abraham Maslow who called it a peak experience when everything just comes together. And in a way, it's like you're being given the words to a song or they feel they write a song and it took like three minutes. And other times they have to really you know, slog over it. Or if they're on stage and say, and when I was um, um, interviewing, I think it was Stephen Stills, Tatomi and Cros uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash, they're all on stage and suddenly they all start the wrong verse at the same time because it's all about connection and they're just in this other place by then. And often, you know, you can get the audience going into that other place as well and everybody takes off at the same time. And I am fascinated by that. Yeah. Well, I think I, it's magical, you know, that's the thing about creativity and, um, you know, it is, it's magical. Well, that's one of the things I was going to say to you that, that, you know, as a musician for, you know, for over for almost 40 years, this is sort of the thing that I, at least for me in your book that kind of resonated with me because it's something I chase all the time. That's what I do. Mm. I'm looking mm. for that big experience for that moment that some people call it the zone or whatever, but it's that moment right. where everything is connected and you're not thinking you are literally just in the moment present as they say present. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and then you, I ask musicians about that. They say, you know, God, if if I knew how to make it work, I'd be doing it all the time, but you don't. Right. But I think that's the thing about when you're in that creative zone, it's happening. 
Right. And things just come out of that. And a lot of synchronicity, you know, it's the same. It's like Don Henley talking about looking for the end of the verse to, um, what was it? Deadhead sticker on a Cadillac. Yeah. Uh -huh. Remember, what's that yeah. song? Um, um, anyway, and there the was this Cadillac right in front, yeah, right in front of him with a deadhead sticker. And <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you. You know, you've just been given stuff. And that's what uh, they all live for. Right, which is exactly what I was saying. As a, as somebody who read this book, and it was like Clapton had said in the book, he didn't realize other people had had these experiences. There wasn't really a medium like podcasting no. to share this between each other. No. I mean, like you're hanging out. No, but, yeah, because nobody talked about it. Right, right. And that was my little worry when I very first started these questions was, you know, it's like you never ask somebody about the muse because the muse is so subtle. That's what they used to call it, that it would just be, oh, you can't talk about it. It's too precious and we want to be visited by it and we don't want to scare it away. Every single musician described, of course, by then we were calling it the peak experience, but every musician talked about it. And, um, and they'd never talked about it before. They'd never had an interview Mm -hmm. where they were asked about this before. It was the first time, but that was, what, 1988 to 1990, I did the interviews. Now it's more common knowledge, and people call it the zone, and, you know, then we know that uh, athletes get it, and all sorts of people get it when they're really in that zone. Mm -hmm. They can just do no wrong. Right, right. It, it, there, there's that moment, and it's happened to me. It happens, like I said, I chase it because it's the ultimate expression moment of your of your entire you remember that night forever when it happens yeah it's that power yeah and it's like a drug yeah and you chase it that's right. why it's all the time yeah. and in your book yeah. it really gave me a, a, an awakening to that i wasn't alone in these feelings and that I, and once i connected it with sports i kind of like oh yeah i remember these moments where you're not you it's all instinctual yeah yeah but you know the new book the difference between that book I wrote then and the book I've been working on all this year is that I kept all the cassette tapes of every musician that I interviewed. Okay. And that was, you know, many years ago, I was living in LA. And then since then, wherever I moved to, I'd drag all these cassette tapes around with me, like, you know, 75 of them, right. terrified that any of them should go missing, that anybody could take one or, you know, really guarding them with my life, putting them in bank vaults sometimes or putting them in cupboards or locking them in drawers. And finally, I just thought, I don't know, it must have been probably a bit less than 10 years ago. I thought it's never going to come out again. You know, this book came out the you know, the interviews were like 35 years ago. Why do I need to keep them? And, you know, like some of the tapes they said things that you would I'd feel they trusted me I don't want to let anybody else hear this stuff so I destroyed them Ooh. took out all the tapes and destroyed them except for seven and the seven that I kept and I don't know why I kept this seven you know it was like duh um the one I've the ones I've got are Joni Mitchell Don Henley George Harrison Eric Clapton um Ravi Shankar Graham Nash, um, jazz drummer, um, and, 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 what's his name? Um, I just blanked on his name. I'll think of it in a minute. Mm -hmm. And who else? And um, oh, and Ringo. And um, and so I kept those, and sort of that was easy to move around. And finally, I found a friend who I knew had worked with BBC and asked him if he would turn it into an MP3, into sort of um, digital, because I didn't ask anybody else just in some shop because it was too loaded, you know. You just never knew whether you'd get it back. Right. So that's what we've got. I've transcribed them all. And so they're all in the book, the full interview for the first time. Awesome. Um, and then what I did was I interviewed more people, more current people like Jacob Collier, Mm -hmm. um, and then I interviewed um, Atticus Ross mm -hmm. because, you know, he's got quite a few Grammys from all the music he's been doing, film music, mm -hmm. and um, a songwriter called Egg White, and he's, you know, written songs for Madonna and just those sort of people, and and a very wonderful singer who was very sort of poppy in the 90s called Sarah Warwick, what's called Sarah Washington, 
and she got cancer at some point and that where I the why the reason why I want to interview her is how music can be a healer and he you can heal yourself with it with the writing songs and all this so um so in that way it's different because I wanted to find out from these newer ones is what's the difference between the music world now and the music world then mm. and it's great you know now we have spotify you know it's it they they just describe everything that's so different nowadays mm-hmm. so it makes it a sort of um just gives the book a little more depth a little added depth right right that's awesome i'm glad i'm glad it's coming i you know it was just pure synchronicity if you will that that i hit you up at that point where this book was coming out because i had no idea it was <laughs> yeah it was, i couldn't believe it when i saw that yeah 30 years yeah well i just, you know i want to think about this book from time to time as I would have experiences as a musician, and and I started this podcast thing about seven years ago, and and actually I haven't mm-hmm. done, I haven't done one of the the musical journey ones in a while, but basically I was doing what you were doing. I was interviewing musicians about their career yeah. paths, and and getting to know how they did things, and out of that same curiosity about your book, you know, same way. So yeah, it, it was odd that yeah. it, it came around that that I just thought of you, and I thought, well, you know, I should just reach out and see if I can get her. Yeah, yeah. There we go, and that was this whole new book appearing. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm a big believer in synchronicities and 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 all of these things that you talk about in here. Um, there was a few things that I want to ask you about. With uh, well, particularly I I brought out. You can see it over here. This is the uh, it's sort of a tribute to Peter Green. This guitar over oh. here, the, the yellow one. Yeah. It's yeah. this famous guitar. Now Peter Green went through this period where. And I, I just really read about this story the other day where he's at this commune or whatever. And he, I don't know if he took <laughs> drugs that night or not, but then he fell into mental illness after this. Is that? He correct? did. He took, he took acid. He took acid. I think he took a, it was these girls he kind of came in, came across on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I think they just gave him a lot of acid. And my belief is that when you have somebody who is so sensitively in tune, um, you know, with their, I don't know what you'd call it. Well, you know, he was just a, such a brilliant musician and so in touch and his songs were so beautiful that people like that, when they take acid, I think it's um, it's almost as if the conscious and the unconscious kind of meld together. It kind of gets rid of that boundary between the two. Mm-hmm. And so whatever, I mean, you know, he did, that's when his illness started. And it's interesting because there's a person I know who's been uh, writing for a long time, a really, really um, in-depth book about Peter. Mm -hmm. And he interviewed um, Peter and he interviewed his brother. And and so he's given me, when I asked some of the questions, asked this person, Christopher, who's written the book, did you ever ask Peter, you know, this question? And um, and he uh, he said yes. So I've got some of that in the new book. Awesome, right? Yeah. So Peter's in there. I wanted him to be in there. Well, one of the reasons why and this has a personal connection for me because my uncle, when I was a young man, had I think it was acid that he'd taken, and he had this sudden, instantaneous schizophrenia that started. That's what happened with Peter. Yes. You know, it's just like some people shouldn't take it. Right, 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 right. Which is what I was going to yeah. ask you about that because I, I knew about that sensitivity in our family because we've had two mm. that, that had taken it mm. once, as far as we know, yeah. and and in both, yeah. cases, it led straight to schizophrenia. And so you you think it's this thing where they're they're, they're just genetically predisposed, or yeah, uh, well, not predisposed. Well, in a way, only because of the way this is just my own personal feeling is because. They are so sensitive, you know, they're so, they're like sensitive beings, you know, because they pick up on these amazing, um, you know, so they can, they're almost like, um, I don't know, they can draw these incredible songs down. Mm-hmm. Like, they're like channels in a way. Right. right. And um, I think, you know, you just have to be so careful when you're that sensitive, right. that finely tuned. Right, because it's... They're it's- like instruments and stuff. It's interesting because at, in my research for this, I ran across Steve Jobs as being one of the people that also experimented with it. I knew that he had done that because they, they had depicted it in his movie. 
that he had taken LSD and that was part of his his mind altering creativity that he had, you know, for some people, it seems like it opens a door to something yeah. like you, yeah. you had said about early in your, your life where you had this moment where I kind of also study near death experiences. And I noticed yeah. that, that, that this transformative it's a transformative moment where they feel like they have been at a place where everything's connected in the way that you had discussed in your book. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about somebody. Um, he was actually someone who I, I he was in a writing group that I was in, where he was like um, a bank teller or something like that, and he had a heart attack or there was for some reason that he actually was sent to hospital and then he was actually pronounced dead. But then he kind of somehow he came back to life. <laughs> uh, he was pronounced dead. So then, but then, you know, obviously I think it happens sometimes you kind of get them breathing again. Sure. When he came to consciousness and he said, he remembered that feeling of sort of leaving his body and going up when he came back to consciousness, um, he didn't want to be a bank teller anymore. He couldn't stop writing children's stories, writing one after the other. Right. And he'd never done that before. You know, it's unchanged in that. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this story, but it's just interesting no, no, the brain can work. Well, that's what I was going to say. When people have these awakenings uh, to these other these other yeah. places, they it's almost this channeling that happens with musicians where we feel like like some things are sent down as we're creating. You know, like a lot of people will say this. I mean, Eric Clapton said it in your book, I believe. Um, the guy that I do a podcast on, Eddie Van Halen, of course, you probably know his name. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He would always say that he was given things. It was given to him. Yes. And here's the other thing. A lot of them talked about this, that when they're sleeping, because I asked them all about dreams, if they had, you know, unexplained dreams or unexplained experiences. A lot of them said that in their sleep, they suddenly come up with a riff or words and they have to write it down. So a lot of them have either a recorder or something, you know, write, have to a pen and paper where they write it down. And if they don't, they forget it. I'm oh, sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's, the next morning they can't remember. So it's like if you have it, you've got to. Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he said, you know, there was one night where he had to keep getting up about five or six times because he'd go off to sleep again. And then that something else would sort of come into his head and he'd have to write that down. And uh, yeah. I was going to say one of the things about yeah. that particular process that you're talking about what, for me, and I think for a lot of people in your book, they may not have said this, but I think it's a it's sort of a meditative state that works for me like when i get alone in my studio here and i'm just playing my guitar as long as i'm just relaxed and i'm not thinking about anything really that's when the mm. ideas come to me yeah when yeah. i'm not trying to make them come they just yeah i open up a moment where i'm just free of all the things around me and i'm just yeah doing what i do playing guitar and that's when the ideas seem to show up yeah, and I think meditation, because I, I meditate. I mean, you know, yes. or, or it's a TM meditation, but I meditate, and I think that often one can get into a zone, but you can't say, oh, my God, look at this. You know, you can't sort of be the observer. Right. As you can get into that zone where it really does feel like you're just kind of part of everything. Sure. Yeah, in fact, I always tell my wife that I, a lot of my best ideas come in the shower. <laughs> Because that's in, right. A lot of people the shower, or the bath. Four yeah. walls, and I'm just I'm yeah. not thinking about yeah. it. I mean, it just sort of like that's where when I when I flow yeah. through different ideas that that I'm not really I, I'm not really yeah. making a super hard conscious you know thing about trying to figure something out. It just they seem to flow there. That's right. And other ones would say when they're driving, you know, there's oh, yeah. something about being in motion. Yeah. It's still yeah. again, it's like that. Un the unconscious part of your mind. This is why I love this book is because you're exploring this, this piece that happens. Uh, people will say, I actually talked to Steve Vai, who's one of the, you know, one of the greatest guitar players in the world. And, and he was doing mm -hmm. 300 something shows that year. And I said, why are you doing 300 shows? You're, you know, you don't have to do 300 shows. And he goes, says, I'm, I'm practicing being present. And I was like, yeah, he's, he's kind of known for this, I don't know if you know him or know about him, but he's very into the, this kind of thing. 
and uh, you know, he's mm -hmm. in Eckhart Tolle. You know, Eckhart Tolle is. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. To the very end of Eckhart, and then yeah. So he he does this thing in his show where he'll actually at the end of the show he will stand on stage for like must be like five minutes, and he will try to lock eyes with every single person in that room to sort of acknowledge wow. their, acknowledge their presence. When I was uh, doing the audio book of yeah. this of the new book, the the Icons of Rock. Um, you have to really concentrate. Talk about being present. Sure. You know, I could be reading about David Crosby and then I my mind wanders and think, oh, yeah, you know, it's such a shame that David died. And, and then it's like, oh, you've got to come back again. You know, you just got to stay truly present for about seven hours. It's quite something. It's a, it's a task in a way to, to, yeah. to, to keep yourself. It's a task. I think with musicians on stage, yeah. on stage, it's it's easier because you get lost in the the audience and in the moment, the excitement of it, and you kind of like, yeah, you tune out because not only are you focus on what you're doing technically, um, the audience has you kind of uh, in a state that you that you just kind of fall out of that thinking about, you know, lunch or whatever or dinner. <laughs> you're too busy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you just know there. You know that you just know when you're all connected, you're all in the groove, and right. you also know when the audience is with you. Totally. And of course, that then turns into how do you keep that feeling going? And that's why a lot of musicians then sort of took to drinking and taking drugs and all that to try and keep that high that they experienced on stage. Yeah. So when Clapton, mm. Clapton, you know, I, know, I of course know a lot about Clapton's history as a guitar player and his drinking and, and the drugs that, that he did back at, at certain points, which you were kind of uh, around because your sister talked about yeah. some of this. And some of the interviews I saw, um, it, did you feel like that his addiction and his problems were related to his fame or to this, the idea of being um, not in your own head? Cause I think a lot of people drink just to take a little edge off when they go on stage and then it turns into a bad thing. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I think the funny thing, you know, um, just talking about Eric is that obviously I saw a lot of him because Patty was married to him and, and I just lived around the corner. Um, but he was the one, without him knowing, that inspired me to write this book in as much as, you know, you always got to get a little a little germ of something to kind of get an idea, is that I wonder why he used to drink so much yeah, yeah. and was it because and he used to downplay himself and say no anybody can do what I do you know he really downplayed himself and I think um is it because he feels so um I don't know that is it because he's scared of this gift that he's been given mm -hmm. it's too much for him it's like touching the hem of God's garment and when I interviewed him, and he was had stopped drinking by then, you know, those years later, he said, it's exactly that. It is, you know, sometimes it's like you feel you're just naked and um, in front of in front of everything. Uh, it's it's almost too much to bear. Right, right, right. I, I always wondered about that. And I, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, Eddie Van Halen, who I who I do a podcast on. Um, Eric Clapton was his hero. Eric Clapton was his, yeah. you know, everything he, that inspired him was Eric Clapton. And people don't really realize that about him because playing wise, it's very different. But, mm. but he, they also followed that same path down drugs and alcohol and, and it nearly killed probably both of them at one time or another. But yeah. I always wondered about like with, with Eddie, because I know a lot about both Clapton and Eddie, but this, this whole fame thing that happens when you become this mega star and then there's the pressure to continue to create at this level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, then, and mm -hmm. you get caught up in this thing where you're trying to, you don't know if you're just trying to relax with drugs and alcohol or mm -hmm. you're trying to deal with the pressure. Cause all of a sudden you go from, you know, just a normal player that to this guy who's expected to do magic. Yeah. 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 You got to show up basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tough, I mm. imagine, to be in that situation. And mm. Something your book said uh, about 
loners, people that when they were younger, they they saw a hold up in their rooms. Like this is something that all guitar players seem to know is that we all come yeah. to this place where we, we, we hold up in our room as young men and we learn how to play guitar. Yes. Our outlet. So yeah. what, what was it about yeah. climbing and that loner thing that you were, you were alluding to? Well, I suppose um, he felt different. He felt different to other kids. Yeah. And, um, you know, because then when he found out that actually who he thought was his mom was not his mom, was his grandmother. And his mom was actually somebody else who's lived in Canada. I think he found out when probably when she came back to England. So he felt different to all the other kids. And um, that probably sort of made him kind of go inside himself. So a guitar is the perfect thing or an instrument or something that can express what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then eventually, you know, there were like a few, he would say that once he became a teenager, there were other kids that felt like they were misfits. So they became the sort of the village beatniks that were before beatniks had ever been sort of heard of. Mm -hmm. So um, So he was different. And he said, and then musically he was different. And, uh, you know, it took him a while before he found somebody else who actually understood him, Steve, Steve Winwood, mm -hmm. who understood him musically. He said it was that grim at that time, sort of uh, late 50s, yeah, early 60s. I was going to say that, that uh, Winwood, as you were bringing him up, I had another note about him, that – what's common between all these people as well is that they didn't have formal musical educations in the traditional sense. Yeah, that's right. I would say that probably for pretty much all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, because they yeah. didn't like me, they probably, I was the same way with school. I, I, uh, I enjoy learning. And of course this whole podcast is about learning, but it, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. for some reason I didn't click with the traditional way of doing things of learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I found that to be a common element with those people as well, with Winwood, with Clapton, and Eddie Van Halen as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of them felt did, did feel different to the other kids. Yeah, you know, I mean, you can't tell exactly what the other kids are feeling, but you know, they did feel sort of slightly they they were slightly different. But then you have someone like Graham Nash, you know, from Crosby, Stills and Nash, and he said he knew right at the very beginning he would be famous. That what he had, and I can't remember who it was he was singing with when they they um, had the band The Hollies to begin with, mm -hmm. they both knew that they had wonderful harmonies and wow. that they would be going places. Wow. So he was very confident. Well, you have that too. You have you have musicians that are that are you have those outliers that are that are very confident as well. You have it's funny how they, they tend to like Richie Blackmore be one of those people. Uh, Ingve Malmsteen, who's one of the more modern, modern '80s guys, guy I grew up with, a uh, very confident kind of knew their destiny. Very, you know, even today, those people are still like that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, but actually, just going by the side, by the way, um, I saw Graham playing because, of course, you know, dear old the Crosby is no longer with us, and I didn't know where Stephen Stills was. But he was playing just um, around the corner from where, where I live uh, two, three weeks ago. Okay. And I went to see him play. And um, and he had Bruce Springsteen's guitarist. And he had another musician. I can't remember where he came from. But it sounded so beautiful. You know, it's like somehow they still captured that wonderful sound from uh, Crosby, Sills and Nash, yeah. which, was, which was, was great to listen to. Right. It's, it's amazing that, you know, these these situations that you get in where we were talking earlier about peak experiences. I was in Nashville with my wife. We were at a singer songwriter thing at a, at a very famous place uh, there that is for singer and songwriters. And we had a kid come up. We didn't know anything about him. He came up and what happened that night was the thing that we were talking about. It, 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 it started with him and then the entire room. And it was the most like. I don't even remember his name today, but I just remember that yeah. that magic. When I try to explain to my wife this creative thing, I say, do you remember that night? Well, that's what it feels like on stage. When you're yeah. in the audience and you have that transformative moment with the, with the performer. Yeah. Right. Flip that around. It's the same thing on the other side as you're 
on stage. Yeah. It's and very- and yeah, and the people in the in the audience, they're sort of um they're picking up on things that uh, the musicians are feeling and putting out there. And it's almost as if they speak for them in some way. Yeah. You know, there's a kind of identifying. And uh, and I think there's something very special about musicians. And, um, you know, that to me, that was very clear in the 60s when I was in San Francisco. Just we were waiting for the next Bob Dylan record to come out. Or we were waiting for the Beatles. And then all you need is love. You don't have to be searching for God and you don't have to be doing this. No, you're you're let off the hook. It's like all you need is love. So it was like, oh, great. And that was the message. And it was like the musicians of our, they were like the messengers of our time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it's still like that, probably. But I'm not so up on all the different musicians nowadays. Um, But I do know that, you know, a lot of them that came from that era are still like the Stones, you know, they're still going out, um, Fleetwood Mac, and, uh, you know, there's just something they all had at that time, which was a magic. Hey, that's amazing. And, and there's still, obviously, there's still musicians today that have it, but um, it, it was interesting, very pronounced. You saw Fleetwood Mac when they hit, I mean, with Buckingham Nick's version, right? That was when you were kind of in the midst of it. Yeah. The- so that, tell me about how that. Yeah, was- yeah. Was that really hard for you? Because, I mean, you say this in your book that you were alone a lot. He was gone all the time, you know. Yeah, it was because I was the only one that had kids out of all that lot because we were like a family. Mm-hmm. You just have to know you're not like a normal husband and wife. You're not like the most important thing. <laughs> you're part of the family. <laughs> right, right. The, the band family. <laughs> and But we were the only ones that had kids. So, of course, when you've got kids and we moved from another, from our own country, you want the dad to be there. And, of course, he couldn't. And maybe he'd come in early hours of the morning or probably in the morning, being in the studio all night and all coked up and, you know, so they could finish this album in time. And um, it's 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 hard it would have been easier if i didn't have kids i would say Mm -hmm. but if you've got kids you're trying to create a family so it wasn't that easy for me and yet you know i love listening to the music or love going down to the studio kids all love the music and Mm -hmm. you know but they were quite small at that time um Mm -hmm. so it, it was it was sort of not that easy this is an interesting thing that I thought of when I thought of you, because you have this interesting perspective on musician types. Okay. Since you've done this book, since you were around so many musicians in, in this sort of what we, we, same thing, we call it the family situation. We really do. We're all together all the time. You know, we're, I'm together. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm with my singers and my players more than I'm with my wife. Most of the time I'm working constantly with them. Right. So it it is yeah. like we're I mean like we're going to my my singer's wedding this weekend we're all going to be there it's going to be a big thing you know and uh, it it really is like that but from a from the standpoint of musicians do you find that personality type matches a, the type of like the the instrument they play like drummers have a certain personality type. I think that's right that's it the fact that I I married two drummers <laughs> right. at the same time but, you know, one after the other. <laughs> It's um, there's something about drummers, and I think it's like they're very supportive, and I think because they're the backbone of the band, aren't they? Really, you know, they're right. the ones that are supporting everybody else. Right. I think guitarists, you know, they're up front, they're out there, they're much more probably dynamic. But then you have someone like Don Henley, who's the singer and the drummer at the same time. So um, a singer, it's. The music, I think the guitarists are different. I think bass players are very supportive as well. Right. right. Kind of people. Um, I don't know. It's just my own kind of quirky. quirky well, yeah, be, being it. with so many different musicians over the years, I kind of like, we we all kind of feel this way, you know, in our sarcastic way to each other is like, you know, they, they there's you will see that I'll see somebody and I'll go, this is just like the last drummer we had. This guy is just. Right. Hey, hey, they've the got thing. something important. <laughs> yeah, and see, the funny thing is, Natty married two guitarists, and I married two drummers. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> interesting, right? <laughs> but it's, it, then that's yeah, it is funny. Interesting, Things happen. interesting dynamic, though, because you, you said you, you were with two drummers. We see that. I see that myself. I see people, like girls yeah. that I know, 
and they will always gravitate towards the drummers. Really? Yeah, you see. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, they'll other gravitate to certain players, you know, like <laughs> it's it's strange. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It's so wild. But, um yeah, it's great because uh, Mick uh, did quite a nice thing for me for the um, last bit of the audio is I asked him if he would um, just say something like, what's he doing now? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and how different is life for the music world compared to when I interviewed him in 2000 and, no, 1988. Right, right. And it was great. So he's done a little piece that's um, that's on the, um, on the audio book. Oh, that's great. You know, it's great that you still yeah. have that, that yeah, relationship. Still have yeah. that relationship yeah. with him too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's an amazing thing. Let me ask you about the Beatles. We were talking about that a minute ago. So the Beatles as as personalities, you know, everybody calls George the quiet one. You know, if you could like just give me like a short <laughs> description of each one, their personalities, you know, like obviously the quiet one is the what, what he's known for, but what would you say about each one of those personalities? Yeah. Well, I would say because, I mean, I spent those, what, what it was, like two months, I think it was, we were in India to, all together. Not Ringo so much, but Ringo, you know, I still know now because I'm good friends with his wife, Barbara. But um, I would say George was, um, I would say he was more the introspective one. He was quite introspective. Um, and um, Paul, I would say, was probably... But very confident. He seemed to me very confident. You know, like he was definitely well brought up and felt loved. And I get that sort of feeling of him. John, I think of uh, someone very strong, um, and comes off quite can come off quite brash, but actually it's a real sensitive soul underneath. Mm -hmm. yeah. I felt, yeah, and. Um, and Ringo, you know, is just, he's uh, a, a thinker, but also very funny. <laughs> but then when we'd be with them all, the humour that went round, and I think it's probably quite a liver Hudlian thing, is so fast. Their wit is so quick <laughs> that nobody could join in, you know, just apart from, you know, being in an extraordinary position that in their lives that only they have experienced. They're the only ones at that time. Um, you know, they had this connection, but this with the humor as well, it was just incredible. Wow. The, you know, you said something about Paul, you know, in the Get Back documentary. I guess you've seen this, right? I have, but, you know, um, I saw it mm, maybe about a year ago. Okay. And then for some reason, then I got started on the book or I was working on my other book. Um, I sort of didn't finish it. So you just reminded me, I need to see, I'm kind of probably about almost halfway through. But the dynamics, you know, you really get to see it then and thus, you know, how it plays out. Yeah, it's funny to me because when he, uh, this is one, of, I say this all the time on stage because it, whenever I play the song, uh, let, yeah. it, let it be, he's starting to play the song for everybody. And it, it, they look at him like, Oh no, not another one of your ballads. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Or George trying to get trying to get his song heard, you know, like hello, right, right. hello, you know. Right, right. Yeah. It, 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 it's such an amazing thing to see that like the personal relationships between them. And you know, when you talk yeah. about John being, you know, uh sensitive, you know, I had the opportunity, this is a crazy story, but my dad and I went to play golf in Ireland about 10 or 15 years ago. He wanted to do it before he got too old to walk around those courses. Of course, are really difficult. So we go over and I and I'm like, the only thing that you got to do for me, for me to play eight days of golf with you, is you got to fly me over to Liverpool so I can I can tour Liverpool because that's something that's I've always wanted to do. Great. So I went over there and we got you know they have these taxi cabs where they just have one person who's like an expert, and you get in the cab with yeah. them, you go around all the sides, Strawberry Fields, and everywhere around Liverpool, and. uh it, yeah. was, it was an amazing thought thing, but he also took us where John's mother was killed on that street where mm. she was hit. Mm. And, and I always thought about, you know, John's sensitivity and these things that, that his kind of his personality was sort of like sort of torn, you know, he had this 
In the Get Back documentary, you see his humor, though. So you kind of get a feel for who yeah. he was. But you also have, yeah. like you said, where he's a very sensitive person underneath all that. And I want to probably, I mean, just thinking about that situation and the turmoil in his life as a young person, you know, how that might have played out in the music. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And so defended, you know. Yeah. I'm not going to get heard, you know. Right. But, uh, yeah, interesting. I must look at the rest of that, get um yeah. it's just really i mean it is funny because they do kind of like look at paul i'm thinking they think this song's nothing they really think it's like just another one of his songs and i'm thinking this is like one like one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. songs of all the time and they're like right. almost blowing it off like god no, yeah. no. I, I i remember asking ringo you know what was it like for him about right trying to write songs or you know did he ever try and he said I did try, but it's really difficult when you say, hey, fellas, listen to my song, and they're all cracking up and rolling on the floor laughing. He said, it's hard to get any confidence in your songwriting. Right, right, right. Yeah, because, I mean, he did get a few in there. I mean, he did get some songs. But, but yeah, yeah. Paul, you know, Paul and John were, were, you know, obviously the most successful songwriting team of all time. And it's just... They were so connected. See that, yeah. Yeah, you know, they even took us where the church where he met, they met on that tour mm. and uh, in the schoolyard mm. over there. Well, there's a yard next to a church over there where there's the, there's the gravestone of Eleanor Rigby. And they took us over there to that site and took us to where Ringo lived when he was a kid, when he was a baby and the, during the war. And he was, you know, almost killed yeah. in those, those old row houses. It was really, for me, it was like going to, I guess for you, this was like, if you flew to New York city for the first time, this was like me flying to yeah. Liverpool for the first time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Very, very yeah, transformative yeah. for me, a very important yeah. trip. It was so cool. So this yeah. book, this book comes out in the end of this month, right? You said, yeah, October the twenty sixth. Okay, cool. And uh, and the audio, I imagine it'll probably be on Audible. But anyway, the audio book comes out the same day. Cool. And what's so nice in the audio book is that I've they've taken little excerpts from some of the musicians. So okay. you hear you know, you know, say, this is what George says. And the tapes are kind of a little crackly, you know, like when you used to listen to tapes from the twenties or something, you know, but um it's uh, it gives it a little more more depth, I would say. Yeah, I I, I uh one of the since I do all these Eddie Van Halen podcast, the writers of the books that have, that have been coming out over the last few years since his passing, they have been unleashing their tapes, the same kind mm. of tapes you have. And so we're hearing yeah. lots of, uh, of, you know, nice. stuff, stuff that they never actually could have, they would have released during his lifetime, but they can now probably put out there. Right. Yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, don't, for you, you got, you got Harrison and, you know, and he's been gone and, you know, that his, you mentioned his personality a minute ago, but I saw his documentary as well with yeah. his wife, and that was such a great piece on him. It was great, yeah, yeah. And and you got to feel yeah, for thing that you were talking about introspective, you know, it's sort of a mm -hmm. person, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. such great songs. You know, this whole this whole muse thing. How do you feel about it these days? Um. I don't know. Uh, it was interesting uh, interviewing Jacob Collier. Okay. Because he was very forthright about, um, you know, his singing and his songwriting and how he plays. I mean, he's kind of a one-off, I think, with all these different instruments. But okay. it's like he's just playing. He's in his room where he was as a kid and all his instruments are still around him and he just plays. Uh-huh. Like a child. And that's exactly what the whole creative thing's about. Right, right. And I went to go and see him play because they gave me tickets um, to see him play in, in England when he was uh, in England. Because I know he'd been doing a world tour for quite a while. And it was brilliant. It was wonderful. The whole audience is with him. And then he gets them all harmonizing together. So it's like he's connecting. Right. And um, it was a very different experience to all the different bands I've seen and been on the side of the stage off and everything. This was very different. They're kind of with him all the way. Um, don't know. It was it was quite magical. That's that's what we were talking about earlier. You know, when you transcend, you 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 come to this point where it's not about you and it's not about the audience. It's about the moment. It just yeah, it's yeah. 
it's a meditative thing almost like we like you're in India yeah. or something and I don't know how the how the meditation you would you just do it by yourself there in India or, or were you in groups? No, we do it in our own rooms. Um, so you know, I mean I I got as long much as like two two days, two full days and nights, but some people were doing like a week at a time or wow. you know, two weeks. But I know when I came out of this meditation, it was just everything. I could hardly talk to anybody. It was just everything was so bright and um, vivid. And, you know, it's like this incredible joy that you can hardly talk because you'll just, it's all too overwhelming. It was an amazing experience. I mean, you know, because I'd written Jennifer Juniper before uh, this recent one came out and remembering all that stuff. It's, um, I always remember that, you know, and that was what, how many years ago, you know, 69, 1969. It was about, uh, so vivid. I'll tell you how long ago it was. It was, uh, let's see, you said it's 60, you were 68, right? You said, um, it was in 1969 that we went to 68 that we went to India. Yeah. Okay. So it's 55 years because that's how old I am. <laughs> you were there when I was being born. Actually, that was in July. When you were right? born. Or was it later in the year? Yeah. Was it July of 68? No, no. We went in February. We were there till about February, March to April, I think. Okay. So it was before I was born, just a little bit. I was born in June. Yeah. Just <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> That's amazing. I was going to ask you about Peter Green a little bit more. I don't know if you know this story about Peter because you, you allude to this in your, in your book, um, how he became um, un- uncaring of worldly possessions mm-hmm. like you want to give away all this stuff or you, you you guess you know this part. yeah well he says he talks about that in in the book actually about um he he felt that if he if people didn't pay for him to play he could play much more easily because when people were paying for a you know to watch the gig he had to really live up to their expectations or he had made him more conscious. He'd really got to get it right. He was much more relaxing for him to do it for free. I see. But when I remember when we were on, on the road and um, early, early days and uh, Peter coming into our room, mix in my room and saying, let's just be on the road all the time and give um, you do it all for free and, we don't need money and we'll be looked after. And, you know, this wonderful sort of utopia kind of, you know, feeling because he didn't want to do it for for money. Just going on and doing the same old thing and coming back to America or going doing this and it's all for money rather than let's have a free life. So... It was for a minute. I was going, yes, that sounds so great, <laughs> but he was far more sensible than I was. And um, and and the manager, when we had to go into uh, go upstairs and talk to the manager, he'd obviously heard was sitting in bed with a big ice pack on his head. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's a funny story that attaches to the the guitar over here. That's why I was asking you this. Um, well, it's not a funny story. The guitar lives on. You, I don't know if you know about that. Yeah. And I know there was a, a sale recently okay. of his all his guitars and um, okay, musical so, instruments. So his guitar, this is why I brought this up, because when he first sold his guitar, he sold it to an English guitar player, actually Irish, Gary Moore. I don't know if you know Gary. Gary Moore, yeah. I know his name. Yeah. He was in Thin Lizzy. The yeah. Thin Lizzy. Um, anyway, oh, okay. when, when Gary uh, wanted that guitar, Peter basically told him, look, I'll just get, and it's a very rare guitar. He ended up selling it, but he basically just was like, just give me whatever, you know, that you just give me basically nothing basically for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that guitar goes yeah. on and it ends up with Gary Moore for 30, 40 years. And then Gary Moore dies. And then that guitar gets bought again by the current guitar player from Metallica. And he carries it around the world now in the stadiums with Metallica, and he plays it every night. It's still out oh. there. It's called the Peter yeah. Green Les, Peter Green Les Paul, and it's it's in the yeah. guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the same yeah. guitar played on all those records and all that. That period, you would have seen the guitar. Yeah, that's so cool. It's still being played. Yeah, and it has a unique uh, 
mistake in it in one of the pickups so that it has a certain sound that's a little different is wired backwards mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. that became a signature thing and for its whole life that's been what it's been known for is this crazy story thank you for having yeah. coming on today my pleasure it's been uh, really nice speaking with you yeah you too i really appreciate it after 30 some odd years and this wonderful book you know this new book i'm going to of course grab that and you, this audiobook you're reading is that right yeah 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 it's fantastic yes. with your interviews inter yeah. interspersed in it it's fantastic all right jeff well all thank right. you for coming on your show yes thank you so Take much and I'll, I'll let you know when this is out okay okay have all a right. great day you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.